<laughs> the women are here, yeah. The text just Yeah, the, the, women are, the women were here early. The technology's not working. <laughs> okay, um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Jane Tecker. I'm from Learning Technology and Innovation. And um, my role this afternoon is going to be quite brief, actually. I'm just going to try and keep um, Ellen and this illustrious panel to time. Um, really pleased to see so many people for our Networked Edge seminar. Just to remind you all, the hashtag is Networked Ed, not Edge, as I mentioned. Is it LSE Network Ed? No, it's, it's LSE Net, Net Ed. Thank you. <laughs> 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 okay. Um, apologies, we're a little bit late starting, and as I mentioned, we were hoping to be live streaming today, but we're recording this event, so you will be able to afterwards um, watch this and tweet about it and tell um, all your colleagues about it. So um, it's, it's great to have, um, as I say, such an illustrious panel. Unfortunately, one of the panel, Dr. Julia Davis from the University of Sheffield, is unwell, so she's not here today. But I'm going to hand over to Ellen, who's going to be um, chairing the session today. So Ellen Helsper is from our Department of Media and Communication, and we're thrilled that she agreed to do this. So over to you, Ellen. Right. Yeah. Thank you so much, all of you, for coming. I know that there was quite a few people out there who would have loved to see the live stream, so it's a bit of a shame. If you are tweeting, um, hashtag LSENetEd, um, then uh, please tweet that people can tweet questions anyway, <laughs> even if they can't hear it. If they have any questions for the panel, um, we will get them. Uh, somebody is recording them. So please do tweet while we uh, go through this discussion. So my role in this is actually also quite limited um, because we have an illustrious panel and they have uh, a lot of uh, interesting things to say and experiences to share uh, so I will just be chairing this panel and asking some questions uh, I will also leave it up to um, all of um, the people on the panel to introduce themselves because I'm sure they can do that quite a bit better than I could um, and so I guess that's really how we're going to start um, Sue, would you like to kind of like uh, introduce yourself, okay. where you come from, what, cool. what are you, why are you here, why do you think this okay. is important? Why am I here? <laughs> um, I guess I'm here because I've been a woman in computing for quite a long time now, more than, I can't even work out, more than 20 years. And um, I think that the area of women in tech is extremely important and the area of just, just women and where we are with, uh, I guess, equality is extremely important too. Uh, my background is that I uh, left school at 16, uh, then I got married at 20, had three kids by 23, then got divorced at 25. <laughs> no, not, not a great uh, start for an academic. Uh, but then actually became a single parent with three children and then thought to myself, how on earth am I going to earn enough money to look after these kids on my own? Um, so then I did uh, a maths course in evenings at Southern College down the road and then that led me to uh, doing a degree in computing at South Bank University again down the road. Um, and I liked my degree so much that I stayed on and did a PhD in software engineering and then became an academic, um, rising through over seven years to being head of department at the University of Westminster. Uh, about four years ago, I think now, I stepped out from that full-time role because I probably had a midlife crisis and uh, decided that I wanted to try and change the world. Um, and I haven't managed to change it yet, but you know, one step at a time. Um, and uh, so more recently I've been focusing on trying to get everyone to understand the benefits of technology um, because I think there, there just are so many for individuals, for organisations and, and for whole nations. Um, I think that throughout my career I got a bit fed up with people thinking that technology was a bad thing and quite often when, you know like when you meet someone and they say what do you do and you know, uh, people would say to me what do you do so I'd say something like I'm a computer science academic and I think most of the time they would either think oh she's so boring I don't want to talk to her or she's a boffin I'm not clever enough to talk to her but I think you know both are completely untrue. Um, I think that uh, technology offers us a ridiculous amount of uh, opportunities and uh, so what I've been working on is uh, setting up an organisation called Tech Mums which um, is all about teaching mums technology skills so we teach stuff like app design, web design, social media to mums in disadvantaged communities so we've started working in town hamlets um, where I was shocked to find out that the average life expectancy for a woman in Tower Hamlets is 54 
and as I'm 53 next month, I find that quite scary. Oh no, I'm 25, and it's not 25. <laughs> I'm not 52. But wrong way around. Um, so, so we we're going into uh, schools in Tower Hamlets, teaching mum stuff like like app design, um, which is uh, great. I absolutely love it because the mums are wonderful. They're kind of like. East End market store holders, some of them, and uh, just getting them all excited about designing their apps, teaching them Python. It's just, I mean, I love it, and uh, and they love it too. And one of the things that we found is not only does it increase their knowledge of knowledge of technology and their technology skills, but also massively boost their self confidence. So the biggest change in them going through our program is that their their self confidence absolutely rockets. And I think that technology these days is. It's just a great enabler in so many different ways, and uh, we really need uh, everyone to understand that. Um, and I'm particularly passionate about helping women who are kind of maybe in the same sort of situation that I was in 25 years ago, not being able to earn very much money, and wanting to, to try and improve their lives and their families' lives. Thank you, Sue. That's great. I'm sure we'll come back. No, I'm sure we'll come back to a lot of these things. But uh, it's great to hear your your own personal professional story so intermingled. That's great, Cornelia. Well, um, <laughs> I've worked in computing uh, ever since uh, I got my degree when I graduated in 1971. So I've put in over 40 years, <laughs> and uh, I'm a retired uh, professor of computer science. Uh, so. Uh, uh, mostly I've worked in the university sector, but because my area of expertise is software engineering, a lot of my research has been with industry. And uh, earlier in my career, when I worked in universities, I had industrial sponsored fellowships. And I also worked in university startups, which uh, can be challenging. <laughs> um. uh, I guess, uh, and throughout my career, I've often been the first woman to join a department, the first woman to uh, take on a, a, ro a role in my uh, a university or whatever. But I do feel that uh, we have seen a slight decrease in the number of women in working in computing over that time. And I've really, tried to uh, encourage more uh, women to take up computer science. Now, I met Sue when we were re <laughs> doing uh, project reviews for the EU. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Sue was, uh, had this, I told me, I've got this idea to set up a group with a network for women in computing. Yeah, a network <laughs> for women in computing. And I said, oh, great, I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll support that. And I think that was really great. And that was um, about the yeah, yeah, just the turn of the, the last century. <laughs> <laughs> I think one of the other great things that I just found out is that you actually have a, a, a Twitter handle that yes. a lot of people would be really jealous of because you were so early, like just Cornelia. Oh, I'm, a, I, I'm very much an early adapter. Yeah. I love technology. How did I get into computing? Because I love mathematics. Uh, and, uh, you know, I mean, I think... Uh, it's very important to encourage uh, people to uh, uh, do whatever really interests them, to <coughs> follow their talents. And, and also, I think that working in technology can be very rewarding. And it's challenging. There's always something new to learn. So although I retired, I'm 67. <laughs> you're wondering. <laughs> so uh, my life, although I live in Greenwich, maybe the life expectancy in Greenwich is a bit higher than Tower Hamlets. Sure. But they have a better library in Tower Hamlets. So I always <laughs> use the library in Canary <laughs> Wharf. <laughs> but uh, uh, after I retired, uh, with two younger uh, women colleagues, uh, I set up a startup. So I, uh, this is a, a tech for good company. So we've been developing a, a, a social currency called eBarts, so it's to support electronic bartering and to help uh, economically unengaged people uh, buy and sell without money. Great. So we're the opposite of Bitcoin, the opposite of Wanga, <laughs> et cetera. Uh, it's taken a lot more time than I thought it would, so we haven't launched it, but we uh, built a demonstrator, we've been on an accelerator. <laughs> And all these things are great. And 
uh, Sue is the person who told me, oh, apply for one of these accelerators. They're, they're desperate to get more women in tech. <laughs> Great. So that's, uh, that was, uh, that's what I've been doing recently. Amazing story. I'm sure yeah. more will come yeah, up. Yeah, more gosh. will come up, I'm sure. <laughs> Kashka. I don't think I can match it. <laughs> no, of course you can. Um, so my name is Kashka Porajska Pomsta. I'll test you at the end for <laughs> <laughs> your ability to pronounce it. Um, I work at the UCL Institute of Education, but my background is very much in um, computing, uh, artificial intelligence in particular. It wasn't my original choice. I, um, we I went into AI because um, I started in linguistics and I really wanted to see uh, the theories uh, that I was learning about in practice. Um, so I was really interested in, in computational modeling um, of, of you know, the things that we talk about in, in theory, about uh, social interactions and, and um, how we communicate, how we um, uh, how we manage to uh, how we manage our social interactions, and through this um, kind of interest, I also ended up in um, in education, because what I discovered very soon after upon entering AI is that actually there is a fantastic application of technology in education, and this really relates to Sue's point about uh, technology as a as an, enem an en enabler. There are so many different things that we can we can now learn that we couldn't learn before. We can represent abstract concepts, abstract ideas. We can implement uh, theories like I wanted to implement and see them uh, work in practice. And as such, technology really opens up a window onto um, um, our internal processes, our uh, onto our cognition. Um, and this is this is really what um, I focus on in my work. <coughs> Um, what, what about like technology? You know, we found out Cornelia has a, a, a lovely Twitter handle. What is the tech role of technology more in your kind of uh, in your personal life? <laughs> Are you a vivid? I know that you don't. You're not on Twitter. <laughs> but, uh, I'm not on what, Twitter. Yeah. So uh, in your personal life, is this also something that plays a big role besides not being on Twitter? <laughs> uh, well, communicating through email definitely, or more more uh, to the point, avoiding. Um, emails, <laughs> uh, there are just too many of them. Uh, the, I use technology every day and I couldn't do what I do without technology. It provides me with a very kind of um, uh, distributed way of handling and you know, managing my, my thinking and my life. Um, and it also allows me to connect with, with, with people and actually you know, discuss the ideas. Um, I, I couldn't do this without it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's very prosaic, maybe, <laughs> compared yeah, to you so guys. No, but well, we're uh, so we're talking today in this panel about uh, women in technology or women in the tech sector. Uh, so I guess we should first kind of clarify what it is that we talk about when we talk about work or careers in the tech sector. What is it mm -hmm. that, you know, what is this kind of beast with this IT and tech? This Cornelia is Maybe I could say a little yeah. about that. And I think you only have to look at the professional societies for people who work in computing. And they can be very focused, like the IEEE Computer Society, or they can be a very broad church. Uh, in the UK, we have the uh, BCS, the... Uh, the society? To, oh, no, 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 it isn't called that anymore. It's called the Professional Institute for chartered IT mm -hmm. professionals. Yes. Oh. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Hence BCS. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and I think there, the, the IT is applied across so many fields that often people whose specialization is another area, medicine uh, or um, even uh, some artistic uh, installation that uses computing as part of its uh, medium uh, ca can be included. And so it's a very broad church. And one thing is that associated with these professional societies uh, throughout my career, there have often been, because there's so few women involved, there have often been like a chapter for the women. So there's a BC, we, Sue founded BCS Women, and that's been a fabulous, uh, networking environment 
both virtual and actual, uh, to bring together. Uh, so through the BCS, I know someone who worked in local government who now works uh, for Cambridge University Press. These are areas that I wouldn't know much about, but I've learned through her. I know someone who works for a Vodafone. I know someone who worked for IBM, et cetera, et cetera. And that uh, brings together um, people across the pitch, and that means that, uh, you know, and some of these people have gone through the university path and did a career in computer science. Other have come from other disciplines. Uh, some may have uh, gone in as apprentices, uh, whatever. Yeah. So I think it's a very broad church across the piece for exactly. technologists. Yeah. Kashka, we were talking about this earlier, right? And you were saying like it's important to actually kind of figure out what it is that mm. we're talking about when we're talking about Yes, no, I, I, I find it very difficult to engage with, with this career in technology because I don't quite understand what it means. You know, what career are we talking about and what kind of technology? Um, there are many different technologies uh, and even within computer science there are, there, there are you know, different kind of um, disciplines and sub-disciplines. So we have H HCI, human computer in interactions, which, which focus, focuses, can focus uh, much more on the design side of uh, computing rather than kind of low level implementation. Uh, we have artificial intelligence, which combines different, different disciplines to understand fundamentally uh, something about what intelligence is. Uh, and then we have uh, computer science or software engineering, which focuses much more on kind of, um, you know, um, architectural aspect of, of, of um, uh, technology design. And each of those disciplines um, demands different um, engagement with the subject. And it, it also relies on different, um, different potentially different uh, set of skills and, and ways of thinking and, and um, um, interests. So I think we need to, f when we, we are talking about career in technology, we do need to uh, really examine um, and inter interrogate what it is that we're talking about when we're talking about, about technology and what kind of engagement um, that implies and therefore what kind of career or careers are possible in relation mm -hmm. to that. I'm sure we'll talk a lot more about that career path, but mm -hmm. um, so w would you kind of want to venture across? So I was just going to talk about Yeah, that. Like, uh, you can, you can maybe like, it, yeah. Uh, yeah, embed that in, uh, in your answer to the, the other question that uh, it kind of has, like what are the kind of factors that would influence younger <laughs> women to, to kind of start that path and, and get like an education in this, positively and negatively, right? What are these, these factors that make people choose these different different paths or uh, whatever they are and yeah. how they find them. Yeah. Well, I just want to kind of yeah, carry on from where we were. So I think that um, uh, what these guys have said is right and I think that um, because new technology is coming out all the time so the goalposts are changing all the time so we're trying to draw mm -hmm. a boundary around what is technology, what you know, which jobs are in technology. That's getting harder and harder to do because practically every job that there is these days involves technology of some sort. So, you know, I think you can't draw a boundary, it's quite difficult. Um, but I think that's a good thing because technology is an enabler, right? It's a tool that we use to, to do things. And uh, <coughs> like Cornelia, Cornelia was saying, you use it in all different sorts of jobs these days. So I suppose maybe you have to just be uh, a bit more specific about when you're talking about it in particular what you're saying the boundaries are because you know where you could have a broad boundary you could have a small boundary and they both would be right mm -hmm. um, so it's it's quite a hard question so to answer but I think we're kind of in a transition phase at the yeah. moment and we're sort of moving towards everybody using technology yeah. all the time. Mm -hmm. So do you think that's a good or a bad thing in terms of motivating younger women to get yeah, into no, it? The no, fact absolutely. that the boundaries are vague or more no, limited? I think, is no that I think that's a good thing mm -hmm. right because there are so many jobs now which involve technology in some way so, you know, think of any job that young women might want to go into, there'll be some technology mm -hmm. in there, really. Mm -hmm. And the more that they understand of that technology, the, the better chances there will be of getting a job in any kind of field, yeah. I mm -hmm. think. And so I think like when I started my degree, basically, it seemed like, so that's like 20 years ago, but um, it seemed like 
the jobs at the end would be <coughs> you would probably be a programmer and that was kind of it really wouldn't I didn't really know about any other jobs and I didn't want to be a programmer so that's <laughs> one of the reasons I became an academic I probably <laughs> <laughs> but, um, uh, whereas now there's just ridiculous amounts of opportunities you know that I mean the whole web thing's taken off there's, uh, there's mm. apps there's all sorts of services all around sort of on the periphery around uh, coding around producing software you know that's a massive massive industry and then there's the whole you know even like the the marketing and PR you've got to understand the digital part of that mm -hmm. and so you need some kind of grounding in technology to be able to to do that competently mm -hmm. I think yeah. I think flexibility is a, a big in, uh, kind of factor because uh, I don't know what careers people have or what you may be planning but I, a lot of young people who I work with, they are anticipating that they will have a portfolio approach to their career. They're not planning to enter one profession and stay in it forever. And uh, in a sense, uh, I think, uh, and in a sense that's probably what makes your work life exciting if you've got new challenges, if you're taking on new things. Um, but if you're a technologist, I think one of the key things is you are working with human created artifacts that, that have been engineered or designed by others. And it is also very satisfying when you can build something yourself mm -hmm. uh, or uh, help develop a technology. And that's an important, one, one important <coughs> part of uh, the computer science area. So uh, I had the pleasure in my career earlier on when I was an industrially sponsored fellow of uh, chairing in the UK the C and the POSIX <coughs> standard committees and contributing to those standards. So C is a programming language and POSIX <coughs> is a codification <coughs> of the Unix interfaces which is still living on in the Linux system that many people use today. And so uh, it's everything that we use in technology it has been created by humans, that they're not natural artifacts. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's so exciting, you know. I tell my students, we're creating things out of thin air. We're not physicists. We're, you know, we're not uh, working, uh, applying physics or, you know, using natural elements as chemists do, et cetera. We create things out of uh, pure thought and thin air. <laughs> so you you mentioned earlier that uh, you'd seen like uh, you know, and this is backed up by some of the statistics that we've seen that there's less and less women uh, entering into what we might call technology yes. degrees or careers. Yes, what do you yes. think? What are the factors that that kind of hinder I, some of I these women? I had a very interesting week a few years ago at a UNESCO seminar looking at what are the problems for women in mm. STEM. And one of the key things that came out of that was, we have to think about changing the system. Women don't, we don't have to change women. <laughs> <laughs> there are lots of aspects of the system that are unfriendly to women uh, in our education system. And even something basic, which I, I was shocked by this. There was a woman who was, uh, worked in the pharmaceutical industry, and she said, uh, the legislation for drug testing means that most drugs are only tested on men. So, so the dosages for women are not even, off, are often incorrect because, mm -hmm. so that's like gendered science. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was shocking to me. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, that's obviously why we need more women in science yeah. to drive <laughs> drive this forward and uh, you know and also male rats because um, it's easier to control male rats in a lab <laughs> really. I wonder if all the women who are deciding not to go into tech had these kinds of examples <laughs> <laughs> no, this is this is stem this I know yeah stem, stem more in general yeah. Kashka, did you want to yeah I, I just wondered to what extent these statistics are taking into account women who are who are using computing but under different uh, discipline. So, um, you know, I, I actually <laughs> I actually know a lot of women who do really hard computing, but in different disciplines. So, 
sociology, cognitive science is very, very full of women. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, psychology, um, you know, these kinds of subjects. Um, I'm, I'm, you're probably fam more familiar with, mm -hmm. with, the, with the stats than, mm -hmm. than I am, but uh, the, to what extent, you know, uh, these kinds of disciplines are being taken into account. So, for example, in, the, in cognitive science, um, which, by the way, was inspired by computer science in many ways, um, computing is very, very, you know, it's central, really, to, mm -hmm. to, the, to the entire enterprise. And when you look at uh, most uh, psychology labs nowadays, you will see that actually um, researchers there uh, use and rely very, very heavily on technology, not just to do the stats, but also to actually run their experiments increasingly, using, um, designing and implementing uh, uh, things like games, for example, to test their theories, to, to, to be able to, to control uh, their, their experiments better, or use advanced technologies, um, sensing technologies like eye trackers, for example. Um, you know, and they are actually in communication with computer scientists. There is a dialogue going on there. Mm -hmm. So I wonder whether we shouldn't look more broadly at the disciplines and where technology is used and to, to what extent when we, when we draw these conclusions, when we, when <coughs> we say that, mm -hmm. um, yeah. you know, women are actually, yes, when you look at computer science, there are fewer women. There is no doubt about this. Yeah. I think one thing that is interesting is you probably know about the government's plans to uh, introduce computer science into the core curriculum. The and coding. Uh, and teach coding at a very early age. Uh, and But in a sense, forget about the coding. It, of course, that is a, it's a great that the kids will learn to code, but it's rather like uh, uh, playing the piano or uh, being able to read music, et cetera. I think uh, the key thing is uh, comp what people have called computational thinking and problem solving. Uh, to, and in a sense, these are skills that uh, are applicable across mm -hmm. the scientific field. And it's to be able to think abstractly, to uh, take a number of cases and find the general uh, rule uh, to uh, understand a problem that where you may have some knowns, some unknowns, and work out how you can uh, go from what you know to uh, uh, what you want to find out. You know, uh, I I am not a very literary person, and I have to tell you that the way I wrote essays was to copy what I learned in geometry. <laughs> But I would argue that actually <laughs> this kind of computational thinking can serve both the arts and the, and the humanities. Yes. And I have seen actually uh, with my students, I've seen it with myself, um, that this kind of engaging in this kind of computational thinking forces you to actually express your um, thoughts in a much more precise way, in a much more rigorous way. And it gives you um, the basis for, for, for a different kind of reflection. Um, and the quality of the of the writing, for example, that this engenders um, is is quite different from you know from the quality that you get uh, sometimes at least from from uh, you know people who who have just engaged with um, with humani humanities. Yes, yeah, right. it just it just really does shift uh, a perspective on on how you interrogate the world, how you interrogate yourself, and how you present it to others. Mm. So, so you you are doing, you are helping women yeah. uh, uh, mm -hmm. learn how to code. So what do yeah. you think that brings? What is it that you know? What is uh, for? Uh, there's a lot of talk about getting girls and young women sure. to learn how to code. What is yeah. the what would that help us do? What's the great yeah, what's the great it? thing about it? Yeah, it's a really good question. I suppose so. So with the Tech Mums program, the first two hour session they um, learn um, like basically to offer skills like documents and spreadsheets. Mm -hmm. The second week's app design then web design, social media, online security, and then coding in Python is the last class that we do. And um, and so in a way, that's kind of what we're building up to through the whole thing, mm -hmm. is like helping them to feel comfortable around the whole using the keyboard, learning about the computer. Uh, so I suppose that's the most difficult. I mean, I think once you've got, got the hang of it, it's not difficult, but like as a concept, if you've never done anything like that before, 
then um, programming can, can possibly be quite hard. I know quite a lot of the mums are quite scared of it, really. Like they just think they won't be able to do it at all. Um, but I think, I suppose because I taught programming for like 15 or 20 years, <coughs> first years mainly, mm. I know where to start and I know how to help them, which is basically you just talk about um, cooking and recipes. And you know, because it's, it's a, or yeah, knitting. yeah, or knitting, <laughs> because there's there's loads of stuff all around, which is kind of the same kind of thinking. We just yeah. don't, people don't put those things together. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, and um, it's really great actually teaching your mum's uh, programming because you you know you kind of you, so you've got some East End market store holders uh, sitting around in a classroom, and they're all a bit scared of, of even though they've done the other stuff, they're a bit scared of uh, programming. Uh, and then because I, I just make it really, really simple where you just kind of change one little thing at a time and, and kind of talk about the, the, um, the kind of structure around what you're doing um, underneath it all. And I've already told them that it's just that's how you tell the computer what to do because loads of people don't know that that's what it is. You know, they just think it's this hard thing. They don't really know what it is. Yeah. So just explaining actually what it is, what it does, uh, and then get them to write simple uh, programs. And what we usually find is, at the beginning, they're really scared. Then they play around a little bit. And then what usually happens is we miss the tea break because they don't want to stop doing <laughs> it. So it's just like it's this really scary thing if you don't know what it is. But as soon as you, if it's, if, if it's presented to you in the right way and you just play around with it and, you know, you're in a sort of supportive environment, then, you know, it's, it's amazing to see them get very excited and, like, showing each other their, their mm -hmm. programs. And I, I just, that's kind of like my favourite bit of the whole programme. Because it's you know it's something that they are really frightened of, and then suddenly when they actually understand what it is and they have a go, they absolutely love it. So you can do it. Mm. So it's the self-esteem thing that you were talking yeah. about. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Uh, through and presenting it in the right way. Yeah. yeah. Through BCS Women, women I've uh, run uh, workshops for what we call women returners. So these are women who may have a qualification in STEM, ha may have worked in computing have had a career break and now want to return and just want to get updated on what the latest technology is. Mm -hmm. And those are always good fun mm -hmm. because almost the students have as much fun talking to each other, telling each other about their histories, what they did, what they're doing now, etc. And uh, really they're so pleased to come into an environment where they can pick up a kind of pick up new skills and uh, improve the skills that, that they kind of let go to uh, seed while they've been doing other more interesting things. <laughs> so it seems like from what we've been talking about so far that it's, it's about kind of integrating it into kind of a, a wider perspective, not making it about yeah. the IT and the technology, but what you can do with it. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, so, and I'm guessing the women and uh, mm -hmm. young women, older women <laughs> that uh, you've been working with have all been kind of keen to learn this. Kashka, would you want to talk maybe a little bit about those people who don't really see the point? Um, that, like, what, what do you think, how would you say coding or all the things that come around of in technology, what, what, is, what would the benefit be um, for, to get into that mm -hmm. career and to work in a world, oh. uh, to work in this kind of sector? I think that, well, uh, that's a big question. A question. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, there are, in fact, several questions here. Yeah. You know, what would be th the benefit of coding, of engaging or learning how to code uh, be? Uh, I already kind of touched on this. I, I do think that it en engenders the computational thinking, and that um, leads to other things, specifically you know, the ability to view the world and interrogate the world in a different way. And also, it leads to a different way of communicating with others because you need to tell the computer what to do and you have to be very precise about it. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it kind of, you know, it, it starts something different, a different way of, of, of interrogating the world and yourself in, in that world. Now, in terms of the benefits, um, that is very much a question of utility the pragmatic utility of, you know, what does it give me, you know, uh, to know how to code in a practical world? You know, can I get a job? Uh, what kind of job can I get? <laughs> um, so, I mean, it's a very, it's a very complex question because it, it just, it just depends on how useful you, you, you think that, that, that skill is. So for a, for a, uh, 
a psychologist who wants to design um, you know, a test bed for their experiments, it is incredibly useful. But a lot of psychologists don't enter mm. uh, into the, the, this discipline with this, this kind of view. They learn on the job. They realize, oh, right, I need to implement the uh, something, a game, let's say, or some sort of uh, control you know, through uh, uh, a virtual environment because that gives me the ability to record the data systematically, to immediately analyze it. I can uh, show it to <coughs> others. I can share it with others. And I can do it in a very, very rigorous way. Um, that's a real motivator. But to code for its own sake? You know, the message of, of the, the change in thinking <coughs> is, is, is probably, it doesn't travel very far. <laughs> <laughs> from to control the network, to control the world network. Well, because it is actually a very hard thing to do, to think very, uh, in a very rigorous way. And it can get to a point of, of being really annoying. Um, I think there's two kind of levels. Yeah. So the kind of level that I'm doing, you know, working with the mums is to, help them see what it actually is, have a little go and feel confident that they actually can write some programs. And that's not because I want them all to become programmers. Mm. That, that's because I want them to understand that they've got the power to tell a computer what to do. And that's quite mm. an empowering thing rather than kind of thinking that computers are telling us what to do, mm. which, you know, is uh, in a kind of big brother way. Um, so I think it's very empowering in that way. But I think that, so I think it's good for, for kids to be taught it at school, not again because I, I think they should all be programmers, but because it gives them an understanding of the language that's used around technology. And, you know, programming is kind of right at the core of what's happening there. And if you can understand that at just a basic level, I think it gives you the power to understand so many conversations around the whole digital mm -hmm. world. And the world is becoming more and more digital. And so, that's a conversation that, that they're going to be having quite often yeah. uh, growing up. And so this part is of digital literacy kind of like yeah, part yeah, of absolutely. that whole package. Mm -hmm. yeah, so we've talked a lot, uh, like a little bit about, you know, education and career, like the, that, that first step on the career. But obviously after that, there's a whole life ahead of you yeah. where you might be working. And we've uh, had some problems in trying to define what <laughs> that field <laughs> is. So yeah. uh, if, with that background, um, the other kind of striking um, uh, findings that we've had recently of, um, in, in research is that there's a lot of women who are working in what might be traditionally called the tech sector who drop out uh, around their mid-30s. Um, they drop out for a variety of reasons, but they don't tend to come back, which is relatively different from other sectors where, you know, right. they might be carrying responsibilities, but people still try to come back. And mm -hmm. it seems to be something there um, that um, it's maybe specific to tech or STEM where women leave and, and are less eager mm -hmm. to return. But what, what, what do you think the reasons might be for this? Well, I, th like I think yeah, you wanna it's hard to say exactly what the reasons are, but I would say from when I finished my degree, the friends, uh, female friends that I've got in tech from around that time, I can't think of hardly any of them that are still in tech. So practically everyone's left. Mm. Um, and I think there's lots of reasons. Um, it does seem to me that at some point um, in our lives, kind of going into our 30s, into your 40s, especially if we're working in big organisations, normally there's just ridiculous amounts of politics around all sorts of things. And I think kind of at their core, women are more interested in actually doing stuff that matters rather than just ticking boxes. I'm um, sweeping generalisation, but I would say for at least from my friends anyway, the women that I know that are in tech want, want a career that actually means something. It's not just about getting a paycheck. And so um, most of them, for one reason or another, have just got completely fed up working for a big organisation where all different sorts of things have happened all around kind of politics and um, but also kind of glass ceiling issues. Mm. And what I really hope is for the next generation of, you know, for women that are in their 20s now that that is changing. I, th I think it is. I mean, I think the stats are that there's about... You know, like we, when we kind of started out, there was about the same percentage of women in tech, roughly, as there are now. Um, and so that's depressing, right? Because I've been kind of campaigning mm -hmm. and, you know, like connecting women together and trying to do stuff, as has Cornelia, for the last 20, 25 years. And the numbers are the same. So, like, I could just go and sit in a corner and cry about mm -hmm. that. Yeah, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I won't. No, 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 no. But, no, but, no, so the, the, but the change that I do see is that people are talking about it now. Mm. You know, like when I set up BCS Women, 
the sort yeah. of comments that I got from people, women as well, not just men, was why are you ghettoizing yourself? Why put yourselves in a ghetto? You know, why, why have only women group? What's the point? Why can't men join? You know, just like loads of stuff. And I kind of had to fight against all of that mm -hmm. to have an online network just for women. And, you know, some people thought it was great. But in general, people were like, you know, why are you doing that? It's yeah. just a bit of a weird thing yeah. to do. Whereas now, there's loads of women's networks for women in tech. And, and it's seen by companies as an important thing to do now. So yeah. they're kind of taking yeah. notes. Mm -hmm. So that's the big thing that's changed. It's kind of the environment's changing. But the numbers haven't changed yet. But they will, yeah. I think. Yeah. So can I, you, you have I a think many forward-facing uh, companies are valuing their women yeah. engineers. And... Uh, and honoring them, which I think is great. Mm. Uh, but one thing I wanted to say is, uh, I'm an academic, uh, uh, and that's kind of my second career. I didn't get my PhD until I was uh, in my 40s, and then I, 10 years later I became a professor. Before that, I lived by my wits. So mm -hmm. I was what you might call an itinerant <laughs> researcher, <laughs> and everyone thought I had a PhD because I was good at my job, but I didn't. <laughs> so then, um, around 40, I thought, oh, if I'm going to get on in here, I'll have to get a PhD, and I did. But <laughs> what I wanted to say is I saw this statistic. In, um, in the UK, 50% of people, when they get their PhD, leave academia, and it bifurcates along the way. But that isn't a big loss, because those people take their PhD experience and knowledge into industry, into the private, uh, public and private sector organizations, uh, et cetera. And really that, and, and the interesting thing is, of course, this was to look at promotions in mm. universities. Uh, you know, you bi keep bifurcating and only about 8% of people become professors in the end. But, um, and really that doesn't matter because wherever people fall out of the loop, they're probably going on to do exciting things, one would hope. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think that's like women in tech. Women do drop out, it's true. But partly it's because we don't count the women in tech so comprehensively. Uh, because there are people who work in allied fields where they have a strong technical role, mm -hmm. but they may not identify themselves professionally mm -hmm. as technologists. Absolutely. But also I think that um, the, uh, when you look at it, the, um, there is a, a sort of uh, movement, I think, now that uh, the value of technology in our society is so core that it's hard to see how uh, when people are moving along with their technical skills, they are probably doing a valuable job. And many women, I think, when they hit that barrier at 40 or 50, often set up their own companies yeah. or... Yeah, they all, I mean, <coughs> my friends that I was talking about, they have gone on to do other things, but yeah. quite often it's either in a small company, like as a startup, so like me and Cornelia, yeah. uh, start up their own company or work in a smaller company, but kind of like most of them have moved yeah. out of the big um, yeah. company kind of yeah. scenario. So yeah. can we talked a little bit, because this is about almost like about the division of labor. Ty certain types of jobs mm. are being taken out by, uh, m mostly by men, while the women drop out of some of these and, and take, you know, like a, a different path. Mm. Like what do you, uh, Kashka, what do you have? Well, I, I, I was just thinking about, um, we were talking about this earlier, yeah. actually, about the fact that um, if we're talking uh, uh, about technology in terms of software engineering um, or computing at a quite a low level, um, this is actually generally regarded as, as a profession for the young. And the, the, further you, the further you progress in your career, the, the more you will, you're kind of approaching the either managerial level, mm -hmm. so you're kind of removing yourself from, from coding, and the youngsters uh, are, are taking over the, the, the coding mm -hmm. aspect. Um, or you're just becoming too expensive, and or, in mm -hmm. fact, you're becoming too expensive. So uh, there may not be such, a, such an easy way in back you know, mm -hmm. for women you know, at, at those higher levels, um, if they are very experienced, you know, the, the employers may tend to, not all of them, obviously, but, but no. some will uh, consider 
paying less rather than, um, than, than, than more. And this is actually a problem not just for women, it's a problem for men as well. Mm -hmm. So past a certain age, around about 50 or so, um, this can become a real problem for, for male programmers as well mm -hmm. and software engineers. Um, so what is it about these younger, the, the younger, you know, are, what are they, let's say, putting up with to keep in that career where, at the point where women, uh, like your friends, are like say, okay, mm -hmm. this is it, I, I don't want to, to deal with mm -hmm. it anymore. What do you think that? Yeah, well, I, I think that also, you know, the, the, the career in computing at such a, you know, uh, 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 level, I mean, involving coding actually is incredibly intense and it's very isolating as well. Um, it can be. It can be. It can yeah. be. It depends on, on, on what you're doing. But um, it is very intense. You often work, uh, uh, you know, towards very tight deadlines. There is very, very little movement, you know, in terms of, man you know, room for maneuver for, for moving these, these movements. And it does relate to this, to this issue of, of um, having to care for the family and <laughs> having to go and pick up your child. I've been there myself. Mm -hmm. um, and th this can be a real obstacle. Um, which, you know, many, not only women, also men, don't want to put up with. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it really requires quite a lot of, at the very kind of um, hardcore <laughs> level, it does require a lot of uh, intensive, uh, intense uh, involvement mm -hmm. and dedication and very long hours. Mm -hmm. But it brings a lot of satisfaction. Uh, one thing it is, does. though, I mean... <laughs> but you have to balance the, yes, <laughs> the two. We all know money isn't everything, but if people do have an engineering or a computer science degree over their lifetime, they're largely they're likely to have uh, higher earning powers than someone mm. who uh, doesn't have, have that degree. Yes. Uh, it's higher the, the than medicine. Can you, can I ask higher you something? Than law. <laughs> because you seem higher to than any arts degree. Uh, can, I, can I ask you, because you seem to suggest that it's okay if, if these women leave because they will take their skills and, and kind of apply them somewhere else. And Sue earlier said that it's especially in these more these bigger companies. And I guess a, like a more critical question would be is that it's often these bigger companies that are constructing the world, that are really shaping yeah. the digital world, mm -hmm. right? So like you, maybe if you can to reflect a little bit on, on what that means for these companies, if these women, which are really t talented, take it and leave and go and work in another field, these companies that are quite powerful, let's be honest, um, and that have a certain type of employer. And we're talking about women on this panel, but you know, mm -hmm. there's probably a lot of other people who have a similar view of what they'd like to do with their lives, who are leaving that industry. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Mm -hmm. Well, it's kind of the same question as, um, or related to the women on boards question. You yeah. Know, like, because at, at the top of a company, if you have uh, the kind of um, pale, male, and stale uh, <laughs> kind of, <laughs> if it's totally made up, made up of pale, male, and stale men, uh, <laughs> then um, you're going to get them, you know, I mean, they're going to, in general, kind of have the same viewpoints. I mean, not necessarily, mm. but, you know, you're not going to get much, yeah, yeah unconscious bias and, and, and like no themselves. real <laughs> diversity uh, of opinion. Mm. And mm. I think it's the same with, with women within the companies as well. Mm. Um, so, you know, there, there is a move now to get uh, women on boards, and I, I mean, I, th I think um, that we should have quotas for for women on boards because I think when I, when I was younger, I just thought this will all sort itself out, and you know, like in a few years' time, everything will be okay, and there'll be equality. But twenty years later, mm. it's hardly moved, really. I mean, like I said, mm. the environment's changing, but it hasn't really moved that much, which is very depressing. When you know, like I've had kids; my daughter's now thirty-one. I thought by the time that my little girl was <coughs> grown up, it all would have changed. But it hasn't, and and as a mum, that's that is really depressing, you know, seeing my daughter going out into the world, having to put up with the same kind of basically shit that I have done in my career. Mm. She's got the same thing, mm. and so have her friends, and it's just like, is it going to go on and on and on forever? And when I was younger, I just thought quotas were completely wrong. But the older I get, the more radical I get, and and I think we have to have quotas for a transition period to get women in there to show everybody that actually it will benefit everybody, not just mm. women. Mm. And it w we just and need to pays. make that happen and have it in yeah. for five years, ten years, and I think that will completely change the landscape. We won't need quotas yeah. after that. Do we, do and it pays. <laughs> As, I mean, you know, if you want the economic argument, the, the evidence is there. Mm. Uh, and, but also, it's interesting that when the Scandinavian countries introduced quotas, they didn't get full conformance. As soon as they introduced financial penalties, 
They got over and above <laughs> uh, conformance to the uh, quota. Money talks. And, and, <laughs> and the companies that brought in the uh, higher quota, the higher number per percentage of women on their boards did better financially. Yeah, the so, so yes, that services. was, a, a, that is a big win. And uh, the, uh, you may not go with this, uh, you'll earn more money if you <laughs> stay in technology. But uh, we all know about the Equal Pay Act, but we still know that there is a gender gap in many uh, organizations. But in the tech area, that gender gap, generally women who work in tech earn more and the gap is left lower. Mm -hmm. it's, not, mm -hmm. it's not zero, but yeah. it's lower. But th th there seems to be a need for a much broader uh, and more radical culture change because it's not just oh, yes. about it's Definitely. not just about uh, the culture within the companies and the quotas. It's also about the, the, the kind of culture that women a lot of women have to deal with when they go into careers, regardless of what career we're talking about, whether it's technology or whatever whatever else. The more successful the woman is, the more, the more shit she, she gets, <laughs> she yeah, gets from the outside world. Mm. You know, dropping off the kids at school, you know, engaging with mothers uh, may be actually quite difficult at times, especially mothers who do not work. I mean, there is a lot of judgment out there, and it can be very, very off-putting and very hard to deal I with. I think partly it's that the men don't do their share. Mm -hmm. And so well, uh, it's, it, our society has to rethink things. Uh, and men have to stand up for women as well. It isn't just women. Uh, it's even worse if they do their demanding. share, because then, then your you know, head like as a woman gets we've, kicked we've in. Got, <laughs> we've, we've got all women <laughs> on this panel, but if I go to a technical conference, mm. generally, I can look through the program, identify five of my friends who might be, <laughs> might be on the program, and uh, the majority are uh, chaps. That's mm. in a, a computer science conference yeah. or software engineering. Yeah. And uh, one thing is that people have said, if a man's invited onto a panel and it's all men, uh, if he uh, would like to support women in the profession, he should give up his place. He should say, I mean, I didn't contact you and say, oh, you've got all women on yeah. the panel. Why don't you ask a man on? Yeah. But, um, the, uh, I, I think we still have some way to go redressing the historical balance. But uh, I think it is important to get men to stand up for women, to do their share of the work. And, you know, as far as I'm concerned, childcare is a parenting issue. A child has uh, generally two parents, and, uh, yes. you know, organizations should take care of uh, helping parents. Yes, I've that's yes. I've heard some. Uh, <laughs> Murmurs going in the, <laughs> in oh, the right. uh, on the floor, so I think this might be a good time to see if anybody has any questions. We have a gentleman here in the back. If you could say maybe a little bit about who you are and then uh, ask a question. Yeah, you know, the microphone's got a nice feed as well. So yeah, yeah. Yes. Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Farid. Uh, I'm the CEO and founder of Pink Pink Studio. So we're uh, we're a tech startup, and I'm really proud to say that two of our ladies and guests mm -hmm. are actually in the room. Great. Um, uh, I'm also the proud daughter. Of I think that a lot of the stereotyping starts to seem very scary. Mm -hmm. I used to work for Lego, and, and I think that when you think about, about, it, yeah. you think about um, young girls playing, um, uh, you very typically parents, and I think parents are totally guilty of this, uh, is that the parents will automatically gravitate towards getting dolls, getting uh, pink things. I'm, I'm really anti-pink things. I like the <laughs> hair, minus the hair. So I think that stereotyping starts very early. And, and you'll see them buy the Lego for the boy. Uh, and you'll see them, and not Legos come up with Lego friends, and this is not meant to be an ad for them. But the point is that we need to do more to basically get girls exposed to things that drive those constructs that lead to that kind of curiosity yes. around technology, around discovery, around building. Uh, and, and I'm certainly doing that with my girls, and I hope that by the time they grow up, they are as curious about building something. Yes. My challenge is that by 10, my other one should hopefully have created their first game. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I think you're right. Constructive toys, praising uh, your children for the effort and work they do, not just saying you're clever, you're pretty. Yeah. Uh, well, 
that's fine too, but you know, you should focus on uh, actually engaging them and uh, being proud of what they can do. Somebody else have a... Oh yeah, when, oh, I was going to say, when I was little, um, yeah, my brother got the Lego and I didn't, so I played with my brother's Lego. My brother got FX kits. And he didn't even like them. I used to build them. <laughs> 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 and then he, he like and train sets and stuff. I used to build all the put all the, the houses and whatever together because I loved doing it. So, but yeah, if I hadn't had a brother, that wouldn't have happened. Right. <laughs> um, hi, my name is Allison. I work um, with Ellen in the Department of Media and Communications, um, and I primarily work on and in and around technology. Um, and one of the things that I'm interested in my work is how things work and how making understanding how things work makes a difference uh, to society. And um, I also have a daughter who uh, I was just showing a picture of her learning cryptography. Um, her dad is a hacker and so anyway, she likes, she has a lot of, a lot of different kinds of tools and including tools. Um, so, it, so I can watch her learning how things work. So my question is about how computers work. And we talked a lot about different skills that you have that are uh, related to tech but may not be related to the tech industry, about leaving the tech industry at various career points, since my partner's a programmer, I am sensitive to this fact. Mm -hmm. So is mine, hence <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> but does it make a difference if you actually know how things work? And this is the question sort of a, for me about coding, um, that it's not just that, we're, that we like technology, but it is also that we really understand actually mm -hmm. how it works. How much do you, of a difference do you think that makes? Yeah, I think it makes a massive difference. It's just like anything. If you see something as a kind of um, as a black box and you, you can't see inside it, and, and however you you feel disconnected from it, right? So, it, just by teaching our mums what hardware is, what software is, because we don't really know what what those words mean, and that that's what makes up a computer, and that the software is sending instructions to the hardware to do something. It, you know, it's just like that's I don't know, thirty seconds of information, but even just that on its own can really help them to, to feel more empowered around it. So I think the more that we understand how things are working, the better, really. And I've, uh, one thing I think about um, women in tech, one thing I found really interesting, when I was head of department, we were trying to get more girls and women onto our courses. And um, what I found really interesting was that um, teenage girls absolutely love their mobile phones and technology, YouTube, um, and all the stuff around that, but don't actually realize that computer science is, is connected to that in a massive way, in that that's what makes it all work. And that if they're involved in, in uh, producing or understanding the, the computing at underneath everything, they can be part of making phones uh, or technology that relates to them and their world and that does the things that they want it to do, rather than just being given products that are developed by someone very different for them, which doesn't really do the things that they want it to do. And so trying to connect all these things up together, I think absolutely the understanding at the some kind of bottom level of what's going on is it just really can make a massive difference. And this is, this is also or m even more so uh, important in education um, for teachers to understand how the technologies work as opposed to how they can use them. Uh, because that, that really empowers them. And I, mean, I teach teachers at the, at the institute and, and I insist on um, them engaging in design activities, design of the technology as, as a kind of means of um, them also engaging in the, in the um, design of the use of technology. Um, and it can be really empowering for them. It is very empowering for them. Because they go back to their classrooms and they don't, they stop asking this this really irritating question of how do I use an iPad mm. in a classroom, and they move move on to a completely different level. How do I use this particular technology for what I want to do? What does it give me? How can I change it? And so there is a kind of uh, a shift, you know, uh, from from uh, self perception as a consumer and the expectation that the technology is going to change something for me immediately just by the sheer fact that it's, it's in my classroom to the, to the kind of co-creator or creator mentality. We own the technology. It is supposed to serve us, not mm. the other way around. Um, Absolutely, yeah. But, I mean, uh, all of you probably are involved in education of some form. And, you know, education, <coughs> knowledge is power, you know, understanding, you know, if you understand something, you can control it. Uh, just, uh, 
to a certain extent, obviously. Mm -hmm. But you know, especially in the field of technology, you know, uh, being a passive user, well, that's no fun. <laughs> Um, of, you know, of course, <laughs> it's not to say that, you know, uh, everyone who uses a colored television has to understand the physics of how the images are produced, etc. Uh, uh, but uh, the more you learn, the, you know, if that, become, that can become your passion. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's like tr cars, you know, you use a car, do you know how the uh, engine works? or you know, probably are driving by wire. It's probably software, uh, uh, largely, that's controlling your car. Obviously, the basic mechanics are similar, but, you know, they're, computing is so embedded in our everyday life that it does give people an insight. But that's not the only thing people can learn about. And I'm very excited now about uh, what some people call organic computing. That's growing your computers and growing their energy sources. Uh, because obviously computers use a lot of power mm -hmm. and uh, yeah. we want to do that in a sustainable way and so. So you have another question there? I, so it seems a little bit about um, it's not necessarily uh, learning coding for its own but because of all the <laughs> kind of additional benefits like that it allows to us to do. Like yeah, learning to learn read. Yeah. It doesn't mean yeah. you're going to be an author yeah. but it yeah. does mean that you can understand the world around you and you yeah. can use it to do things. It's the same with, with coding and just understanding yeah. computing. It's the same thing. Learning to play, the, play an instrument, yeah. you know, and reading I think music. One uh, of the things that you were saying before is about how it makes us understand that these things are created. Like, yes. yeah, oh, like they, okay. that, that yes. they are actually products of, yeah. of human yeah. <laughs> intelligence or the stupidity. Voice, you know, they, and, they uh, drop and from and the sky. Either way is good. Yeah. <laughs> just on the individuals. Um, it's not enough that a girl is interested in technology and wants to do it. There are barriers almost at every turn. She was the only girl in the coding club that she did at school. And this, this was an issue, you know, when you're in private school and you want to fit in, you don't want to stand out. Um, I went to an event, at Femin I went to feminism in London in October. One of the breakout sessions was uh, women in STEM and I went along. And amazingly quickly, straight after the presentation by five amazing women in different areas of STEM, the Q&A went straight away to barriers, to uh, sexual harassment, to uh, lack of social threat, you know, of, of social mm -hmm. Girls who, who do tech subjects at school suffer from having less friends. If you do it at university, some of the women were talking about how people at university were saying, well, you're taking up a guy's space. You're going to go off and have babies. You shouldn't be here. Companies and then they get into that, the yes. organization, and they're asked if they're the person serving the tea or <laughs> comments, you know. And, that, and that's why there's dropout, among other things. That's why there's dropout, both at school level and at university level and then in careers. And, and yes, it's great that women are going off and doing other things, but we have to ask. What are those things? How well paid are those things? How influential are they? You know, Ellen was talking about the big companies where women are, are dropping out. Those are the companies that are shaping our world and women are falling out of them. And so in addition to women on board, which I agree with Sue is a crucial thing, what else can we do to, ch to change the structures, to change the culture, um, that, that, to, to, to bring about equality? It's in so, so important. Right, I think that might be a question that I'm going to ask each, each of you to kind of take a stab at. Uh, it's a complicated mm -hmm. one. It's the kind of fundamental one, I think, mm -hmm. of this panel. So I would like to give all three of you a chance to react. Kashka, do you want to? Well, I think through education is how we change um, things. I think education, you know, introducing coding, which is, which is um, very much on the agenda right now. Not, not just education of girls. It needs to be education. For, for, of everyone, yes, absolutely. It has to be part of, um, it just has the to be a natural mainstream, main, mainstream education. Right. Yes. Um, that, is, that is, you know, we have to start at the, at the very, very early stage, as um, the gentleman at the back was, yeah. uh, was saying. 
um, and actually, you know, but it changed this, this, this uh, through that, changed the, the, the culture of only boys do programming. Um, to my mind, this is, this is, this is really the most um, um, effective direction because it introduces that culture of we all program. Uh, we all deal with with the design of the of the technology right from the right from the start, and this will generate uh, women, role model women in in um, uh, uh, tech companies. It will also provide women workforce in tech f uh, companies. It's because it's not the case that the companies are not looking for women; <laughs> they just can't find them <laughs> because it's, it's basically off-putting. Uh, but perhaps for a lot of women, or perhaps they don't have the, uh, the, the, the skills because of the education that um, uh, they engage with for the reasons that you mentioned, because they were, they were you know, it's a, it's a vicious circle, basically. So we have to start right at the beginning of, of the educational process. I hate to say it, but I disagree with you. Okay. I, I, think we have to do <laughs> I think that's part of it, but we have to do it at lots of different levels with lots of different groups of people. And so if you just focus on the kids that are at school now, well, it's another 10 years till they're working and then another 20 years till their mid-career. That's 30 years' time. That's another whole generation gone past where nothing much has happened. And so we have to do lots of different things. I suppose the reason I started Tech Mums was to get out there and create, to, to, to help uh, women who, to um, understand technology and improve their circumstances, also to help them communicate better with their kids, but also to create female role models and also to create female role models that, that aren't, the kind of Sheryl Sandbergs of the world, <laughs> but just like everyday <coughs> women, like like me, <laughs> um, or I, how I was 25 years ago, right? Just just an average person on the street. Everyone needs to understand the benefits of technology. Everyone needs to understand that that we need an equal society, and that that will make society better for everybody, not just for the women. And so we just need to do so many different things uh, to try and make that happen. Mm -hmm. And it, it's not a straightforward answer. Um, uh, solution, I mean. But I think some things that are key are things like role models. So, so role models are just really, really important, I think, for anyone in any sort of minority. So I think, obviously, as women, we're not in a minority because we're 50%, but we're kind of, it feels like we're in a minority because we're not getting there where we want to go. So we really have to focus hard on um, uh, creating and um, popularising female role model models in tech, but also just strong women getting out there and doing stuff because it's not just about technology you know it's about our everyday lives we're still not able to really do what we want to do in an equal way and so that's the kind of bigger issue which i think both the media can play a part in the government and just us as everyday people trying to make the right thing happen mm -hmm. I, yeah. I agree with both <laughs> <laughs> but i think i think societal change is important and i think it, it's also important that the popular culture uh, embraces uh, women and technology. Uh, probably, you know, a lot of people here have watched The Big Bang Theory. Uh, and, uh, you know, some of the women uh, scientists, uh, you know, uh, there too, <laughs> you know, have a role there. They're not. Uh, and, uh, but I, uh, one of the women, uh, Professor Margaret Ross, who's in BCS Women, has advocated, you know, we need more popular television programs. Uh, when I was at the University of Lincoln, uh, the forensic science course had a high application from women. And in part, it was because we had Silent Witness, we had CSI showing strong women scientists working in that profession as part of the popular culture. And I remember uh, when a friend of mine said, oh my goodness, uh, they've got a, a, a micro on the archers, this is years and years ago, you know. <laughs> but this, uh, you know, I think the pop popular, popular culture has to embrace uh, technology more. And I also think it's important to f try and get through to the parents. Uh, and I don't know, uh, you know, that. Uh, most parents would like their children to be economically independent to uh, have. And, you know, uh, tech is a good way to, uh, for your child to uh, ha have a talent that they can live by their wits with. Uh, so are other professions, obviously. But uh, I think that 
that's important. And, you know, in engineering, we just need engineers. We need engineers across the piece. However, if we had 50% women and 50% men, if we had the equal number of women in engineering as we have men, we would solve our problem. So, you know, we need more women to take up engineering. But then it needs to be sustainable for them to pursue that career. Yes. That's, that's, that's the structural problem. Yes, so and we, I, need to, we need to change society for that. Yes, yeah. and basically. also, you know, we need to change the culture of our companies. Uh, you know, I think a lot of the startups are progressive. Uh, uh, you know, I, I took part in an incubator. I met other people in startups, you know, that, uh, we didn't have equal men and women. We had more men. It's still, it's about ten percent. Yeah, women this was a tech for good incubator, uh, but uh, you know, most of the people were sympathetic to uh, equality issues and and understand, you know, that if you ha if your whole organization is uh, pale male and stale, <laughs> you know, you don't have the diversity. You're not getting the interworking of all those good ideas from different sources you know everyone's thinking the same way it's not all that progressive and you know so you're cutting off you know half you know there's no point in cutting off you know half your working population to uh, you know that's that's not a way forward I was asked the same question about 20 years ago, my first ever talk was in tech, and so I said we need, um, we need a woman techie on EastEnders who's, you know, like really popular, everyone thinks is really cool, and um, <coughs> it's really funny, I had a conversation yesterday with somebody um, who told me not to say anything, but, so that's going to happen on EastEnders in the next few months. So like Great, tw 20, 20 years! years. 20, 20 years, years later! It does have years. to be an infrastructure which can support it, and yeah. the, that yes. infrastructure has to come, I, at least in part, in formal education, sure. and it has to be the role models also in, have to involve yes, teachers. Part of the story. It is part of the story. I agree with yeah. you, but I think this is fundamentally how you, you, you uh, how we can actually get um, technology recognized as a mainstream activity and, and coding in particular. Um, I struggle to see how how we can actually you know we, we will be operating on an individual level if we if we don't go if we don't think about how we can actually uh, infuse education sure, with, no, I think with we that. Need to do lots so of things yes. yeah, one of them it's not the one tech approach I think we have time for one more question so I think you're the lucky one with the last <laughs> question I'm a student and we see in the past I Uh, I think that there's a recurring theme of uh, not knowing what technology is, of not realizing that uh, if you're cooking, uh, you're doing maths. Uh, if uh, you're giving uh, your daughter a set of Lego, you're helping uh, her become uh, an engineer, <laughs> at least to, to plant the seeds for them. Do you think, how do you think that uh, this can uh, change? Because uh, how can this gap be bridged somehow? At what level? Which gap, sorry? What the gap between not knowing, uh, knowing what, what technology, technology is, is uh, yeah. or that not recognizing technology around you. Mm. So he's and talked about changing society, right? And this is a little bit about yes. changing the, the perception that we yes. have of, of technology. I think engineers get a pretty bad press. <laughs> I mean, we don't, uh, you know, we don't pay engineers uh, like football players. On the other hand, football players don't have long-term career pro prospects. <laughs> Yes. Um, <laughs> Dasha, did you want to, uh, Sorry. to kind of try to answer? Well, I, th I, uh, I have the same uh, question as you do, and is it a question that I actually uh, address to uh, to my students every year? What is technology? Um, there is a there is a kind of assumption that technology is anything that is digital, and everything else is not. But you know, this is a piece of technology. 
uh, this is a piece of technology and you know technology is basically a, uh, uh, an, an, an art in which we engage uh, to outwit our circumstances in some way. L uh, language <laughs> is a piece of technology um, and I think what is needed is, 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 um, is a, a more popular understanding, pop by popular I mean uh, um, on, on a more massive scale, that there are different, different forms of technology um, to be had and therefore uh, what that enables us to do is to, is to again engage in this kind of interrogation of what can these different artifacts, technological artifacts, whether it's a book or whether it's a, it's a, you know, uh, a computer game, what can they do for us? Um, so it's, it's really going back to the kind of utility issue mm. yeah. um, for me. Okay. Mm. Yeah, I'll, I'll, uh, utility seems to be a key word for you. I think you've brought it up quite a few times. Yes. I, do, I want to give uh, both Sue and Cornelia kind of a chance to have a few last words, Lost reflections in, <laughs> in the few remaining minutes that we have. Who wants to go first? I think, okay. yeah, Cornelia, I think, go ahead. I, I think it's the personal challenge and if you take one thing away it's that I believe that it's the, the key to technology is that these are artifacts created by humans, by teams of humans, by individual humans, often by teams though. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's people working together and the technology in, is an enabler and uh, that's so satisfying to be involved in the development of technology. Uh, and I, I think if you can get that across to people, uh, that's, of course it's a different path from someone who's inspired in an artistic, aesthetic way. But it's a path that many people would find very, very satisfying, I think. I think for, for like the first time in human history, we've got the ability now to bring people together to solve most of the problems that we've got on the planet. And I think we've never had that capability <laughs> before. So for me, technology is, is the enabler of making the, the planet the place where we want to live, the place where everyone's got equal, like really equal opportunity. And um, I think that we need to help everyone to, to understand that as one of the major benefits of technology. And I think that um, up till now, really, the, the media and the press have portrayed it quite negatively. And um, thing, things are changing. But it's, it's just like, like even now, if you Google technology and the news, you'll get stuff all about gadgets, probably. And that, you know, that's like the main focus. But to me, that's just one tiny part of what technology is and for me the big thing is being able to bring millions of people out of poverty, being able to, to create happy and healthy lives for, for billions of people uh, around the planet. Okay, so technology is a route to inclusion. Let's hope that we <laughs> include everybody in creating that world so that, uh, you know, women, men, people of different backgrounds, different colors, different shapes. Uh, they should probably all be part of this uh, creation of this technological world. I would like to invite everybody to really thank the women on this panel. I think it's been Yeah, and I, I would just like to really thank um, Ellen for uh, chairing yeah. that today, um, which is our last Network Edge or Network Edge event of this year. Um, you'll see on your <coughs> chairs, everybody, that um, we've got some leaflets. If you want to sign up to go on our mailing list to find out about the seminars we've got coming up next year, then please do um, get in touch. We've also got some um, LSE Power leaflets, which is the new um, professional services women's network at LSE. So do consider getting involved and following on Twitter um, if you're interested in this and you're, you're, you work at the LSE. But um, I think we've had a really inspiring um, afternoon here. I, I'm aware we've overrun a little, but if you'd like to continue the discussion, don't run away. We're going to be going upstairs to the library for those who want to stay, and you can continue talking about um, some of the, the really important issues about women, technology, education, how we improve our world over a glass of wine and some nibbles. So we've got a, a reception upstairs if you'd like to come, but otherwise it's great to see so many of you here 
here today, and um, well, thanks for making it a really good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah,